Hello and welcome to the sixth episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series recounting Uganda's key political, social and economic milestones in the last 50 years. I'm Bart Kakosa. We ended the last episode at the 1962 independence celebrations. In this episode, we focus on Uganda's post-independence economic power, the instability within the UPC-KY alliance, and the dwindling numbers of DP members in parliament. Thanks for joining us. At the time of independence, Uganda inherited a very strong economy whose per capita income was close to most of the already emerging economies of Southeast Asia. Agriculture was the major activity with cotton, coffee, tea and tobacco dominating the sector. The expanding manufacturing sector was potentially capable of increasing its contribution to GDP. Copper from Kalembe mines was a very important national product that was fetching the country an annual income of over 500 million pounds sterling. The Owen Falls hydroelectricity scheme was producing unprecedented power for future industry expansion. Uganda was a model of stability and potential progress in the sub-Saharan Africa. The economic policy at the time of independence was tied up with the, the economy of the British and the final is external factors, balance of payment support, foreign exchange earnings, and exchange rate. When you look at the, at the independence, the economy of Uganda was actually very stable. Very stable because it reflected the stability of the colonial power. So with the coming of independence, three things changed. One, governance changed. With the change of governance, there was ideological shift from the colonial stability eh, of law and order, peace and security, concentration on subsistence, this one changed. That is uh, what it was at the time of independence. Macroeconomic stability, positive growth, education, infrastructure, health, all vibrant, tied to the British. That potentially strong economy was backed by a strong regional currency that was pegged to the British pound sterling. It means that it had a fixed exchange rate with the pound. Mm -hmm. When the pound moved or lost value, the shilling also lost value. Mm -hmm. But you had, you, 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 we used to get 20 shillings per pound throughout that period. That's the pegging. So when you are tied to the pound, you are pegged to the pound, uh, your currency is more or less a hard currency because whoever holds your currency is able to exchange it at a fixed rate. Yes. Whether you are in Eritrea, in Kenya, ev anywhere. Formerly we used to be together with Kenya and Tanzania and other countries, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Aden, and Zanzibar, in what we called the East African, East African currency. And that used the same currency? We used the same currency in those eight countries. We had the hold notes. I think it was one cent. You know, the characteristics of currency uh, include portability of the currency. Yeah. The currency must, you must be able to, to carry it al uh, around you. Now, in the peasantry, re peasantry situation mm -hmm. that we had, people were wearing uh, kanzus. They didn't have pockets. People were wearing busutis. They didn't have pockets. They didn't have bags. So the, during the East African Currency Board, they, they thought it better that they would facilitate the portability, the carrying along of the currency by putting holes in those guys so that they can be tied on strings. Uganda's first few years of self-rule saw a series of successful development projects. The new government built many new schools, modernized the transportation network, 
and increased manufacturing output as well as national income. Uganda's independence looked optimistically to the future. Major hospitals, the so-called 22 hospitals, in rural parts of the country, the old Mulago yes. is what we had under colonial time. Then the new Mulago, which became the pride of the whole of Africa, people coming from southern Africa, from Tanzania, from Kenya to Mulago. Our infrastructure, the roads, the railway, hmm? it was during those years that really was, was, was linked up, not just from Kenya, Jinja, Kampala, all the way to the east through Teso, through Langa, Choli, to Pakwach in West Nile, with plans to take it into southern Sudan. Banks, Uganda Commercial Bank, was during that time. The importance of banking in... Opened in 1965 with objectives of extending the much-needed banking services in the rural areas then, Uganda Commercial Bank replaced Uganda Credit and Savings Bank that had been established in the 1950s primarily to cater for African farmers. Formerly, you know, we had foreign banks. Those, uh, the access to their credit by the Africans were no, not easy. So government wanted to support Africans, and they, they said they had better start a, a bank of their own. The first bank was therefore uh, Uganda Credit and Savings Bank. And which stands where the now post bank is. Which stands where the post bank okay, is. A strong emphasis on quality of education for all people, as recommended by the colonial government, especially training in technical subjects, was maintained in the spirit of what was then called manpower development. In colonial times, there were few carefully selected secondary schools. But soon after independence, the national scene in education was transformed. Hundreds of top quality secondary schools were built across the land. This trend was associated with the priority of turning out highly educated people necessary to govern and develop the country. A developing country which needed to promote education with the education aimed at uh, creating the manpower and developing the human resource to take over the management and administration of our country. There was already an impressive number of educated and prosperous middle-class African professionals, including business people. Kampala Technical Institute Chambogo, which had been established in 1928, was specializing in craftsman courses, imparting new skills to man the new industries of this fast developing country. The prestigious Makere University, with its gleaming new teaching hospital at Mulago, was made the University of East Africa in 1963. Makere was a very elitist institution. It was, uh, its purpose was what Sir Philip Mitchell described as Makerere was meant to be an aristocracy of, of culture. Well, of course, but aristocracy of culture meant British culture, which by nature must be very small. It became a focal point for the literary activity that was central to African nationalistic culture. People from Kenya coming together with Ugandans at Makerere, they would, try, they would share these uh, ideas and uh, Ab Ab Mayanja, for example, Ab Mayanja was at Makere, and the food was not very well cooked at that time. And he led a strike together with some students from Kenya. He was uh, discontinued at Makere. But when Governor Cohen came, he said, "If we are going to have opposition, we better have enlightened opposition." And he tried to help Mayanja to go to Cambridge so that if he comes back there will be a Cambridge person to, to, to oppose the British. Now, back to the politics of the time. From the start, UPC was dominated by two young politicians, John Kakonge and Gracie Binjira, who became Obote's closest advisors and strategists. Gracie Binjira was not only one of those closest to Obote in the years before and immediately after independence, but also a shrewd and articulate observer of political events. Ibinjira was quite an instrumental figure. You know he designed that flag you are wearing. But uh, apart from that, um, he was quite a shrewd politician. Uh, he, he believed in the right-wing uh, sort of uh, politics. Um, 
that's uh, capitalism and some conservatism. Uh, so uh, within that time's Cold War politics, he allied with the Western capitalist countries. Um, and um, he became instrumental. Uh, th th there was this internal competition within the UPC party where he uh, led the right-wing group uh, versus John Kakonge, the Secretary General, who was a radical left-wing. Uh, therefore, he believed in like communism, like in socialism, and was more allied to the uh, Eastern Bloc. Uh, and Obote was in the middle. He, uh, Obote was more for the mixed economy uh, approach. He was in the middle of the two. John Kakongo, on the other hand, who had become a Secretary General of UPC in 1961, worked vigorously and became so powerful that by 1961 he was able to defeat Gracie Bindra's proposal that 1961 elections be postponed until the Buganda issue was resolved to minimize the DP's strength and hence persuaded UPC to participate in the elections. He also wanted the party to hire full-time workers, contrary to his colleagues, who preferred part-time workers that would not develop bases outside the party establishment. His personality undoubtedly frightened the center, whose members represented by Obote worked quietly to remove him. When we were preparing for the next 60, 1962 elections, Kakongi was going to stand in East Kampala. Because we were very choosy. East Kampala was a, a Naguruan area. Those were a, an area for workers. So, but then, I don't know, Obote mooted it with the Nekion and I came to the Central Executive Committee and he said, do you know, Kakonge is the darling of the youth. He's the crowd puller. If he's tied down to a constituency, we may lose in those marginal areas where his appearance would make. So, it, I want the executive to pass a resolution that Kakonga should not stand. But he will be one of the nine special elected. He said, okay, you go. So Kakonga, with that one endorsed, we put, Kakonga put himself into the fore. Moved there at the night, West Nile, Rango, way, yeah, way, yeah. By the end of the day, last time we got 27 seats. This time we come with 37 seats with the DP with 27, yes. with our 21 from Uganda. Now once that was done, when the first assembly, the, the parliament, national assembly assembled, the first uh, of, of our business is to swear in the members of parliament. After that, these sworn in members proceed to the next item of the agenda, to elect the nine special yeah, elected. Special Obote, went to this small house, a small office. He spends all the time uh, computerizing on paper and uh, filling in the candidates. First round, this second round, this second. And at the time of, of voting, he passes the paper to all. And to everybody's dis uh, dismay, Kakonge's name was not there. Yes. It was the first betrayal. So Kakonge was taking a beer at Crested Crane. So now he's, he's told, do you know, you have not been elected. He says, how? When it, it drowned to him that actually that thing has come, he sent us a cable telling us the incident and withdrawing himself from the politics of Uganda. He said, this is the greatest betrayal. He loaded himself into a small plane to Tanzania and says, I'm going to Tanzania for political exile and solitude. So he was the first political exile. That act alone shook the whole of the country and the UPC and made Kakonge a hero. Then Nyerere dwelt strongly on Nyerere, on, on, on Kakonge, Nyerere, and said, if you don't go back, that country will be permanently divided and will never unite. But I pray you for the sake of the country, for the sake of Africa, you go back. He returned at a tumultuous welcome you have never seen from Montebe. Opposition Democratic Party, DP, 
which had won a total of 24 seats against the majority of 58 UPC Kawakaeka Alliance in Parliament, found itself in a very vulnerable situation. Right from the start, the alliance strategized on crippling the opposition by luring members their side. And indeed, with the absence of its leader Ben Chiwanuka in the House, the strategy delivered great success. Chiwanuka having had a, a gruelling situation during the uh, 1959 to 1961 uh, period of independence, uh, first he could not come to parliament, so he remained out. Muzei Boniface Bianima was one of the few DP members in parliament that hung on in there and resisted defection. We went there when we were 24. We went there in 62. In three years' time, the opposition dwindled from, from 24 to only four. And the Kabaka Yeka, Baganda who had rejected the DP, save Uganda from DP, crossed from Kabaka Yeka to UPC. And the DP crossed from DP to UPC. So there was a competition. As far as I could see, I could see competition between crossers of DP and crossers of Kawaka Yaka to gain favor from UPC. They were self-seekers. This thing called power, power, authority. Eventually it came to, to, to light, it came out that actually what mattered was power. I remember the late, uh, late uh, M. Kalboa is one of those who defected first. Uh, he said uh, we had a meeting I think on Ginger Road at Namataba at that time. And then he said people this think these five letters here P O W E R power power we don't have power there in Mengo. Power is here, so we must go to where power is. Most disappointingly, the mass defections did not spare the leader of the opposition. Deep in parliament was led by Basra Bataringaya, and it continued to suffer defections to the ruling UPC uh, KY, Kabaka Yaka coalition, uh, which climaxed in uh, 1965 with uh, Basra Bataringaya himself uh, crossing over. But the next morning I went to meet him before he cro we went. I found him in the office. I said, Wataringa, why did you do that? It was you who convinced me to join DP. If you thought DP was bad, why did you keep that secret and you discussed it with the other people with whom you have crossed? But Alingaya didn't answer my question. Instead, he bent his head between his legs and cried and told me it was too late for me to talk about that question. The five that remained, what did you do? Well, we, we chose Latim to be the leader of opposition, and we decided to continue to oppose the government. The little we could add in parliament, plus what the people were seeing in the country, destroyed the UPC eventually. These were people who, uh, I would say, were, were principled, principled. Each one of those people five we are talking about was saying, even if I remain there alone, I'll, be, I'll remain on the opposition. 
All right? So these were people, and some of them were lured. Were yeah. lured. Well, Attempts were made. But uh, they didn't know. In line with the Lancaster Constitutional Conference and recommendations of the Munster Commission report, the post of Governor General was scrapped in 1963. Accordingly, it was to be replaced by a non-executive president, a kind of a ceremonial head of state. During the Lancaster House Conference, it had been agreed that initially, because Uganda was to be a member of the Commonwealth, that we should have a head of state called the Governor General. And the then governor, who was Sir Walter Coates at that time, at independence he became the Governor General, with his powers and duties clearly laid out in the Constitution. Prime Minister Milton Obote, in his capacity as leader of UPC Kabaka Eka coalition ruling government, mooted the idea of proposing Kabaka Mutesa for the position. The idea was floated by late President uh, Obote and uh, his, uh, his group. And some of us um, opposed it openly. Obote sent my name say Kabo Mayanjas, the late now, and I think possibly Kilia and bad people like that, to Bamunanika. Bamunanika is a sort of a country palace yeah. of the Kabaka of Uganda. So I gather, when they got there, they told the Kabaka, I said, what do, you, said, what do you want, you fellows? Oh, we want you to be the first pri- pri- you know, president. You want me to be? Yeah, we want our Kabakas. And the Katike was there, Michael Ochintu. I understand he said, no, I don't support this. I don't trust these people. But politically, somehow, after some time, maybe he was over, over, overruled. Also, but having almost had a, 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 a clear majority, because even you, you, Kabaka Ika members crossed over, and some DP also crossed over his party. He, he, got, he got a big majority in the National Assembly. It brings out a new legislation to say that Uganda should now have a, an African head of state. Get, get rid of the governor general and uh, elect their own head of state. And under that law, there was a provision that those contesting for that position of the president of Uganda should only be constitutional rulers. Mind you, there were five. So, the legislation goes to parliament, and it is adopted, it's passed. Now, the actual uh, uh, elections now start taking place. The choice was uh, between the late uh, Kabaka and the late Jawazinga. And at that time, Javazinga was the vice chairman and person of the, the, the UPC. Um, so, we all converged for different reasons, I think, which came out later, uh, to make sure that uh, the late Kabaka did not become president. All right? Why, why, why would you? We, we thought that there was no way we would have a king as president with no powers, and having a prime minister under a president who had all the powers, you know. Um, Our analysis indicated that sooner or later this would boomerang, boomerang. Parliament selects Mutesa as the new president of a new Uganda. Obote said, when I saw Sir Edward holding the Bible, taking the oath to be president, I knew I'd got him. Got him what? On the target. There was a, a lot of divided opinion in Mengo. Some people were advising Mutesa not to accept being contesting Said no, no, don't, don't go there. Leave them to 
to fight it out themselves. If you can remain in Hawkabaka in Mengo, because once you get yourself involved into the national politics, you may collide with the, those who have the powers. Now, although the prime minister exercised more powers, it was hoped that the prestige of their king being president would satisfy the Baganda. Both Mutesa and Obote realized that Bugandan membership of the Ugandan state could only be achieved if the monarchy occupied a significant position. On the other hand, the presidency was a compromise. Mutesa enjoyed the shadow, not the substance of power, and remained an open question whether this would be sufficient to protect the monarchy. In the next episode, we shall focus on the instability in the UPC Kabakaika Alliance, resolving the thorny issue of the lost counties through the referendum and Obote Mutesa's soaring relationship. Thanks for watching and see you next time.